Today on Straight Talk Africa, a look at the upcoming elections in Malawi. Critics say the poll is too close to call. That discussion is coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America headquarters here in Washington. I am Shaka Sali, and today we are discussing the upcoming elections in Malawi. Voters in Malawi head to the polls on May 21st. Political observers are predicting a tight battle for the presidency between incumbent Peter Mutarika and several top opposition candidates. My colleague, Paul Ndiho, examines the race. Campaigning in Malawi's upcoming election is entering its final stages as voters prepare to elect a president, members of parliament and local councillors. President Peter Motarika of the Democratic Progressive Party has told thousands of his supporters that he will continue to act on his election premises, convincing his backers that he will emerge from this poll, the winner in a landslide. But allegations of corruption continue to hover over his campaign. The government denies the accusations and Mutarika's supporters appear to be unmoved by the corruption claims. I just want him to continue from where he has started because he has been building a lot of constructions in terms of um, encouraging people in terms of education, in terms of some of the people with careers. Yeah, so I'm expecting much from him. Uh, we are somehow ready. We have seen those people campaigning, and we are ready to vote this coming elections. One of President Mutarika's top rivals in this election is Lazarus Chakwera of the Malawi Congress Party. Chakwera claims Mutarika is failing Malawian citizens. More than 50% of the country's 18 million people are living below the poverty line. Unemployment is rampant, life expectancy is low, and the infant mortality rate is high. An estimated 1 million Malawians are living with HIV, and over 770,000 children are orphaned, many due to AIDS. According to the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID. Oh, I can't go again to vote for DPP, but for now, I'm going to vote for Lazarus Chagwera because his manifesto is for good for me. So if make is serious to produce good results that people will indeed vote for this year, we expect to see a change. Vice President Saula Sachilema is hoping to win power as head of a new opposition party, the United Transformation Movement. Political analysts say Chilema is seen as the biggest threat to both Mutharika and Chakwera. Chilema has a large following of young people who want change from the current administration. All Malawians, three quarters of them, they want change. 60% of the people who are going to vote are the youths. Now, most of the youths want Dr. Chilema. Therefore, this, creates, this shows that Dr. Chirima will be the, our, first pres, our, our president on 29 May 2019. Many Malawians remain undecided for whom to vote as president. Zainabu Mangani is one of them. I can't say I'm ready because I don't even know which president to vote for because these presidents are all the same. If I give the vote to this person, I don't know if this world will change. Malawi will remain the same. Because they are a bunch of ish. Wait, what can I say? They are all the same. What they know is to feed their stomach. They don't even, they are not concerned of our lives. And they don't even, they are not concerned of our welfare. Voter turnout may be the key to winning the presidential poll. And the real impact of this election will only be known once the ballots are counted. Paul Ndiho, VOA News. Thanks, Paul, for that interesting report. Um, joining us here in the studio are two distinguished guests, Janet Zinati Kalim, a former diplomat with the Malawi Permanent Mission to the United Nations, and Limbani Kamanga, program manager for the Grassroot Project. And last but not least, Sangwani Mwafurirwa, is the Director, Media and Public Relations 
at the Malawi Electoral Commission. He joins us live via Skype from the Malawian capital of Lilongwe. Well, I have to say, lady and gentlemen, that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the three of you for the first time on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. You're most welcome. Let me, uh, let me go to uh, Sangwani in Lilongwe. Uh, good evening, uh, Sangwani. Uh, good evening, Shaka. How are you? I'm doing great, and you? I am hugely terrific. Thank you very much for asking. Now, talk Thank to you. us um, about the capability of uh, the, and the readiness, in fact, of uh, your institution, the Malawian Electoral Commission. To what extent is it ready to deliver a free, fair, transparent, verifiable, and credible election next week? Uh, thank you, Shaga. I think we are more than ready and we are more than capable. And I can say we are on a track to hold a credible election this coming Tuesday. Because when you are looking at the capability of uh, an EMB to deliver an election, you don't just look at what happens on the polling day, but you look at it as a process. So from where we are coming from as Malawi Electoral Commission, uh, this year we migrated from the... Uh, optical based market recognition system to the biometric voter registration system. Uh, it's one of the biggest projects and one of the successes for the commission. Because if you are looking at a credible uh, voter uh, election, you have to look at uh, those people who are eligible to vote. Have they been given an opportunity to register as voters? This we did as Malawi Electoral Commission, and uh, all the stakeholders recommended us for that. Uh, then you have to go into the issue of uh, uh, nomination and candidates. All the people that were eligible, nobody was hindered, nobody was disenfranchised. We received their nominations, we analyzed. If there's anybody who was stopped from the process, it's on the basis of legal, uh, legal short force, not that uh, there was any political interference. And then we have been in the campaign period, which has run smoothly, and we've got just a few days to go. We go uh, to polling. Uh, that aside, the logistical side, we think we have done our best. Uh, by this time we are talking, we have sent to the castles all the uh, non-sensitive polling materials. And uh, tomorrow morning, we are starting sending out the uh, ballot papers to all the councils. We are quite sure and we are on schedule that uh, come 17th, come 18th, all the polling stations will have all their ballot papers ready, uh, more than 48 hours to polling. Now, I gather that uh, there are six million Malawian voters, registered voters, this time around. Any particular reason why it seems to me that uh, Malawians are politically apathetic? I ask that question because the last time I checked, the last election, you are talking about seven million Malawian registered voters. Uh, thank you, Shaga, for that. There is a big explanation to that. If you look into the statistics of 2014, uh, 2014 we didn't have the national ID and we had about 7.5 million people registering. But if you look at the turnout, the turnout was 70, uh, around 70 percent, which meant, meant that 30 percent of the people that registered last time didn't show up for voting. Now, why did they not show up for voting? You find that uh, during that time, the voter ID, the voter certificate that we are giving as Malawi Electoral Commission, was doing a lot of uh, uh, functional lighters like uh, being used for accessing uh, social services, services, whether it's at the bankers and identification, uh, receiving fundraiser subsidies, and even anywhere you would want to, uh, an ID. Now that coming 2019, uh, our voter registration was preceded by the National Ident uh, Identification Registration System, which registered all Malawians. Now, those who were registering, uh, this is what we think, and we strongly believe that, that those who were registering just to get uh, the voter certificate didn't find any reason uh, to go and register uh, because they didn't see any reason because they are not interested in voting. But that aside, we as Malawi Electoral Commission followed what was in the law 
we are supposed to open voter registration centers for 14 days uninterrupted. And this we are bad to eat. And the people that we are going for registration really recommended us because our system was so fast and efficient. There were no queues. Unlike in the past, though we registered 7.5 million, but we would always have long queues. Uh, during the time of registration. So that could be the explanation. Now, we would not necessarily uh, refer that to as a voter apathy. On our side as Malawi Electoral Commission, we are quite sure that this time around, the people that have registered, 6.8 million people, we should get a higher percentage of people showing up to vote, and like that we have had in the past, and will beat the 70% mark of last time. Now, Sangwani, Talk to me, talk to us about uh, the political playing field. To what extent is the political playing field leveled? Well, I can say it has been leveled uh, to the meaning of the letter itself. Uh, we are experiencing a new dynamic in the, the political landscape. Uh, the commission opened up for campaign for all the candidates to contest. Uh, none of the candidates ha has come forward to complain of being uh, brutalized, uh, being abused. Uh, they have been free to hold their rallies. They have been free, free to hold uh, whistle stop tours. Uh, we should commend the staff that have been uh, involved in uh, allocating venue. They have been really professional. They have not shown any sides. They have stood above political pressure to ensure that the political landscape is well leveled. Uh, looking at the side of the Malawi Electoral Commission, our commission is very independent a political uh, stakeholders have attested to this. We don't have any political side. And uh, what we have been doing, you know, what, what we have been planning, it have been the decisions of the commissions prevailing in anything. I'm afraid uh, that uh, we seem to have lost uh, the line in Malawi. Are you there, Sangwani? Yes, I'm here. Oh, I see. Um, what about uh, the issue yeah. of fake news, um, especially via uh, Facebook and WhatsApp? Well, this is an issue that we can now tell me to be a global problem. Everyone is complaining about fake news. As a Electoral Commission, we have not been spared. Uh, there have been issues that have been coming about, ballot papers marked, uh, marked ballot papers being found anywhere, uh, somebody releasing the numbers of uh, candidates who are allowed to contest when we had not released that, and so many issues uh, attacking the personalities within the Malawi Electoral Commission. What we have done on our part is to ensure that we've got an effective uh, communication strategy, uh, strengthen the communications and building of trust with our stakeholders so that we when they hear of such things, uh, they don't just believe or act on them unless they cross-check with us. Sangwani, uh, final question. There have been some uh, rumors and some, might say, allegations that uh, the Malawi Electoral Commission is uh, in the business of uh, about to rig an election by using a sort of creative accounting. Are you in a position, for example, to talk to us from the deepest, better part of the bottom of your Malawian heart and soul, that the results of this election will reflect the will of the people, the will of the voters, and not the will of those officials who will be counting the vote? Well, thank you. I'm hearing that from you, but I can still tackle that one because uh, what I can explain to you, our polling system and our result management uh, contamination has not changed uh, from the polling station. When we go for voting uh, on Tuesday, all the votes cast will not be moved from the place where voting took place unless they have been counted. And after counting, each and every monitor of a candidate or political party will get a copy 
of those results, and they have to sign that they agree with those results. When the results are taken to the constituency tally center, uh, there will be monitors for political parties and candidates. They will also have to uh, be given those results, and the, whatever we have at the constituency tally center will be audited. That is, if we receive the results, the auditors have to vet, yes, this is really true, what has come from the centers. And then we transmit that to the main tally center in Blantyre. Even at the main tally center, there will be auditors and there will also be monitors of the political parties. So whatever we get at the main tally center, we'll be giving out to all the stakeholders. If they see any anomaly, they will be free to query us. And in this process, I don't think there is anywhere uh, that somebody can claim to say we can give a room for creative uh, arithmetic for somebody to manipulate the results. But we may not be that much surprised with these statements because we are in the elections period and everybody thinks they can throw in on the agenda whatever they're imagining could be an issue that can happen. But believe you me, those that have been close to the process, they will even testify for us that the commission has been more than transparent and has put in place measures to ensure that we have a credible election uh, that we have never had before in Malawi and that would be an even an envy to the own countries in Africa and maybe even beyond Africa. Thank you very, very much, Samwani, for your insight. Thank you. You're most welcome and good luck next week. Thank you so much. You're most welcome, sir. Let me come to you, uh, my sister Janet. It is a pleasure, of course, uh, to finally, finally meet you, as you told me, that uh, you used to also equally host a show in the Malawian commercial capital of Blantyre. Yes, I did. Thank uh, you very much for having me. No, you're most welcome. But uh, it was very interesting that uh, you said that show was modeled on which one? On Straight Talk. <laughs> on Africa. Straight Talk Africa. Yes. <laughs> Why? Well, it's, it has, it's a good model. You liked yeah, it? Yes, yes. I, I really do. Well, I have to say that uh, I am profoundly honored for your compliments and support. You're Let me welcome. ask you a question. You listen to Sangwani. Uh, he obviously sounds like uh, a professional uh, individual who is already obviously up to his job. Do you, from what you have uh, heard, I'm sure you have been interacting with a lot of your compatriots, do you find that Malawians have uh, confidence in the ability, the capacity of the Malawian Electoral Commission to deliver a free, fair, transparent, verifiable, credible election next week? Free, yes, in the sense that uh, everybody has been able to go and register. Fair, it's really not there. And I would say that the Malawian voters are like walking on eggshells. Because the Electoral Commission, Malawi Electoral Commission, as much as it is, you know, acting professionally, mm. it really is at the mercy, its existence is at the mercy of the government. The government? Yes, its resources come from the government. It, they want money. It's the government. But he told us right. that uh, the Malawian Electoral Commission is independent. Independent, yes, but it gets its resources from the government, Malawi government. But in, fair, in fairness to the Malawi Electoral Commission, if that was the case, then how come, for example, five years ago, we had a president, Joyce Banda, who actually lost an election? Well, there were a lot of other things going on at that time. Uh, if we really want to go back to five years ago, mm. uh, if I may recall, bring to your memory, we had the cash gate issue. Yes. And so. But was it that uh, inherited from the, pre the previous president? Uh, that was not the office? narrative that was uh, at the campaign. Wamutarika? That was not the narrative at the campaign. The campaign was, lady, you are in charge. 
this money is, is being lost. This man was shot uh, in your watch, during your watch. Mm. So everything was loaded up on uh, the former president's shoulders, who was then president at that time, and she lost that election. And what about... Uh, because of the narrative. What about back in 1994, the founding president of the Republic of Malawi, Dr. Hastings Kamuzu Banda, the Wamuyaya, the Nguwazi, a man, in fact, who was, for all practical purposes, really, a presidential monarch. How come he also lost that election to Bakiri Muruzi? Now, I'm glad you're going back to history, because I'm a historian. <laughs> Dr. Banda, let's face it, he was, he was old. Mm. He had been here for 31 years, mm. and the time for him to, you know, change and uh, hand over power to others was there. He had also actually uh, been very sick. Uh, what? He had yeah, undergone been very some sick. kind of operation fact, in South he, Africa. If he had won those elections, he would have died in office. So, to be fair, in, in, the, in that time, and, I, you know, I was there in Blanchard mm. at that time, and he was really not in control. Really? Yeah, he was, no, he was not in control. Many times he'd come to a, a, a rally, and he, he closed the, you know, rally, and he had to be reminded that you haven't talked about this, you haven't talked about that. So he was, you know, he was really beyond, really? you know, uh, the capability of handling a nation. And, what? you know, in those days we were saying, look, you are a grandfather, in fact, a great-great-grandfather. You should actually just be sitting at home and allowing your grandchildren, great-grandchildren, to come and chat with you. You but say, not run the affairs of state. There some, that was the sentiments that we were putting in 1994. There are some African uh, leaders, some might in fact say, refer to them as rulers, uh, who feel that they are freedom fighters and that when you are a freedom fighter, you never retire. You die in office. I think that's a wrong, uh, wrong sentiment to have because there does come a time with the example, let's use of Mugabe. There comes a time when you're no longer capable to actually handle the affairs of state. And the sensible thing to do as a freedom fighter is to actually let go. When, you know, in fact, we have like democracies now in, in our African settings. Mm. A term, five years, after five years, you have elections, and then another term after that, that's it. But other presidents, they want to be continuing to stay on and stay on. And this really gives a picture that um, maybe there are only a few people in Africa that can, can rule, which and is not true. Unfortunately, uh, those terms are not covered out of stone because there are very many examples on the continent oh, yes. where the Constitution, in a sense, has you know, has undergone the shifting of the political constitutional goalposts because those individuals believe and they have some supporters who actually agree with them that they are uniquely gifted, <laughs> that they are politically God is gifts to their own countries. And that's wrong. It's not, it's not right. And it all speaks to wanting to milk that golden cow. You know, and because they want to, they have tasted how wonderful the grapes are tasting, they want to stay at the table yes. and not hand over, you know, the Thank leadership. you very much. Let's bring in uh, our brother, Rimbani. Thank you. It is a pleasure to finally host you for the first time on Straight Talk Africa. Well, thank you for having me. Like me, it feels like, you know, it's a pleasure for me as well to be here. And yeah, I'm happy to be here. What about uh, the same question that um, I put to uh, Janet? Mm -hmm. The question referring to the independence uh, and uh, the competence of the Malawi Electoral Commission come next week. Do you have confidence in their independence, their ability, their capability to carry out an election that is free fair, transparent, verifiable, and credible? Well, to a certain level, personally, I mean, I feel like, I feel very, like, confident that um, they'll be able to, like, you know, hold elections that are free and fair and, like, um, 
because again, I mean, the examples that you were mentioning, we look back at the last election, we had like, you know, uh, a ruling party that was like, you know, contesting those elections and they lost. And you look at that, uh, it, it shows you that, you know, it's like, you know, fair game for everyone. And like, um, we have like that history of like, okay, a ruling party is able to lose like elections. And like, you know, when you look at those kind of things, um, you tend to like be confident mm. to be like, okay, this might repeat itself this time around. If, if it happens like the opposition, you know, the people have chosen that the opposition are the ones that are going to like, you know, that have to lead. We feel like, um, I personally, I feel like, you know, it's gonna happen, they'll give way. Mm -hmm. yeah. But what about five years ago, the then president, mm -hmm. Joyce Banda, did not seem to accept the defeat. Unlike, for example, in 1994, yeah. when the old man, you call him whatever you want, <laughs> he considered defeat with grace. Oh, well, I mean, you know, like most of the time when it comes to elections, I think it's very rare, um, especially in our African setting. I mean, maybe I should, I should not overgeneralize. I should say, like, in a American setting, almost every election that we've had, the losers will always come and, like, you know, come up with, like, um, complaints of, like, oh, maybe it was not fair, or uh, things were, like, you know, um, product was uh, uh, messed, messed up on this particular issue and stuff. Even, like, uh, the elections that happened, like, uh, the one that Joyce Banda lost, I think, of course, it's not on a, on a presidential level, but, like, even, like, uh, for, like, parliamentary level, there were, like, uh, allegations coming up of, like, oh, some people, like, you know, complaining that um, votes were, like, um, a compromise. And when they tried to, like, I think they called, they, someone went to the courts, they had to go and, like, do a recounting. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, coincidentally, mm -hmm. five <laughs> called, like, uh, the make offices, so they, could, they were not able to go back and verify the... Um, the tally of the votes. So that's why, like, you know, remember when you asked me, like, how confident I am? I said to an extent. Because, <laughs> like, you know, we have cases where, like, Fire. yeah, you know, uh, in eventualities like that might happen, and those, you know, bring you back to start questioning the credibility of make at the same time. What about uh, some reports mm -hmm. suggesting that uh, Malawi happens to be a very male chauvinistic society that uh, the system may in fact have decided not really to go with the then incumbent president, Joyce Banda, because she was a female. Well, um, I guess like those sentiments can be like um, substantiated in a sense of like, yes, like if you look at it, like um, the Malayan society is still like, um, it's still like, you know, um, patriarchal in a sense of like, okay, at least on traditional level, mm -hmm. we still believe like, you know, the man is the one who is supposed to be like, oh, the leader. And like, you know, if you look at president, even like, you know, the elections that we have right now, there's not many, um, there's not even a woman who is like, you know, contesting among the presidential aspirants. If we look at like, there was a campaign for 50-50, to try to make sure that, you know, in Parliament, we get, like, 50 representation of male MPs, 50 right. representation of female MPs. Right. And, but, like, that has really failed miserably, especially, like, you know, if you look at most of the party, um, um, parliamentary, like, um, um, elections that most of the parties did in preparedness of, like, uh, trying to choose, like, candidates for the MPs, most females have not really done well, and, like, they're forced now to contest on, like, um, uh, as independents, mm. which is a challenge in itself, because like you know, to compete as an independent, you need so much resources. And in a male, so a dominated society where women have like very few access to like resources, it becomes a challenge. And that, I guess, I don't know. I mean, if it comes to like answering that, Marians voted Joyce Banda out because she was a woman. I don't know. I mean, it could be. It could be true, but also because Kashigate, she mentioned, like, you know, she, my Kashigate. colleague here mentioned about Kashigate, mm -hmm. that played a really, really heavy uh, blow on her presidential aspirations. Malawi, like most African countries, of course, are, are very patrilineal, mm -hmm. with the exception of probably of places like Ghana, where you have the Ashanti, yeah. which is matrilineal. Yeah. Well, time happened not to be a best ally, and you are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment, so please don't go away because we'll be right back with you.
voices. We're talking about the news and issues you're talking about. Sharing stories of development and growth across Africa, around the world, and in our lives. Topics that inform, empower, and change the rules. It's time for Our Voices with me, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. And Hadiza Kiari. And Ayan Bior. And Orion Itangi Shaka. It's time for Our Voices. Talk Africa on the Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111. U.S. country code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question. Keep your comment brief and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. We appreciate all of the audience feedback. Straight Talk Africa streams live every Wednesday on Facebook. You can watch our show there and leave a comment. Now let's look at what's on tap for next week's program. On the next Straight Talk Africa, Across the United States are numerous African diaspora associations. Many strive to maintain national unity and preserve their culture, while some pursue developmental and advocacy goals. The role of the African diaspora in the United States on the next Straight Talk Africa. Today we are talking about the upcoming elections in Malawi. Our guests are Janet Zinati Karim, a former diplomat with the Malawi Permanent Mission to the United Nations, and Limbani Kamanga, Program Manager, Grassroots Project. I have to say, uh, lady and gentlemen, that uh, I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you too for the first time on Straight Talk Africa. It's an honor right. to be here. You're most welcome, and the feeling is mutual. Yeah. Let me, in fact, uh, come to you immediately, uh, Janet, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, what about the question that uh, I put to uh, Limbani about uh, the nature and the character of Malawian society? Could, it, could that have been one of the contributing reasons as to why Joyce Banda could not get a second term. As I said before... Actually, first term. The, 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 yeah, the first yeah, term. Because, because uh, she became president uh, mm -hmm. via because divine intervention. Yes, divine intervention. <laughs> 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 yes. Yes. The unfortunate demise mm -hmm. of the former president. Yes. Um, as I said before, I, I believe the... the the big uh, cloud of the cash gate, cash gate. issue and the mm. fact that there was somebody, her budget director, that was shot. And the, this was the beginning of, you know, Malawians using social media for the first time. So the news spread very, very fast. Mm. A budget director had been... Um, had been shot, you mm. know, almost fatally. Mm. And uh, although she instituted uh, uh, a commission to inquire what had happened and what was going on, mm. I think it, it, the the issue, the event, overwhelmed, you know, her, her campaign. Add to that the narrative that. The woman cannot control. The woman if this was not, move. if this was happening on her watch, I she see. cannot control. So that kind of bad mouthing of mm. a leader, you know, when it is uh, directed at a woman, mm. is double the shot as if as if it is directed at a man. And you, you we, we've listened to how uh, you know supporters of the current president are saying, oh no. He's been doing a good job. He's been doing a good job. Never mind that there's been a whole, you know, baggage of stuff that has been leveled against him. If, the, if let's say, APM was a woman. You're talking about poverty. But there's poverty. 
there is corruption. There is corruption. There is uh, an employment. There is no medicine in the, in the uh, no hospitals. Service, no adequate service in no delivery. No adequate services. The roads are not being maintained. And if they are maintained, they're being maintained poorly. And, you know, the issues are very, very, uh, they're, they're uh, you know, truckload of issues. And if it was a woman, mm -hmm. definitely we could actually say this woman is not getting anybody's vote. But because it's a man, people tend to excuse the man. But is he the only man, man in town? <laughs> no, he's not the only man in town. <laughs> he's not the only man in town. But uh, I think with, with Joyce Panda also, um, the fact that you know she was given those two years, mm. uh, and it, 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 remember, it wasn't it, she wasn't given. People had to fight for her to get it because Correct. they even did not. There were there were teams that were having meetings to make sure that she does not get in. You know, she the does not get the, the presidency. The constitution happened to be on her side. Yes, the, not the only the constitution, the but land. also the, there were other institutions like the, the military, <laughs> the military that correct. came in and said, uh, if this woman is not uh, voted in, yeah. you know, yeah, they didn't even finish that sentence. But then uh, that takes away from your point earlier, because let's face it, uh, the guys that man the military, the last time I checked, they are mm. men, <laughs> not women. <laughs> They were actually guarding the Constitution. Correct. And I have to, you know, really take my hat off to the military in our country. Correct. They're very, very professional. Very professional. Very professional. And, and they do... And they're apolitical. A apolitical and professional. Despite the fact that uh, others have tried to politicize yes. them, the military is very, very professional. And we're, we're grateful that they were there yes. and they stood in, you know, in the gap to say no. We, Joyce Banda is the one who's going to be the president. Malawi happens to be one of the, those few countries on the African continent that has never experienced a military coup. Now, you know, I have had the uh, privilege and honor of having hosted the former Malawian president, Joyce Banda, on Straight Talk Africa okay. when she was here. And we talked a bit about uh, Kashigate. And she raised what I thought was a very interesting point. If it is true that I was indeed guilty of Kashigate, how come the man, the president who succeeded me, did not take me to court? It's a very good question. Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. And it's the same question that we ask now. She's been in Malawi since last year. And people, when they're campaigning, some, you know, some of the candidates are carelessly talking about Cashgate and linking it to Joyce Banda. And we say, look, if she was, if she was cleared, one. Two, if she was guilty, yes, I ask the same question. Why has... Peter Mutalika not taking her to court because, you know, he can easily tell his justice uh, department, say, take this woman to court. In addition to that, uh, the last time I checked, Professor Peter Mutalika is not only a qualified lawyer, but was a man who, and, you know, basically earned a living, really, by teaching other people to become lawyers. And not only that, he is the one who was the chairman of our constitutional conference in 1995. Very interesting. So he knows our constitution like the back of his hand, and, and he will a, not do anything unconstitutional. This is a man, according to my homework, who got the equivalent of a doctor of philosophy in law, the JSD the doctor, Doctorate of Jur Jurisprudential Science mm -hmm. at Yale University back in 1964. So if you're talking about law or something of that sort, he's the man, obviously, uh, who knows what it is and what it is not. That's correct. Let That's me ask correct. you, um, Limbani, let me ask you about this question. I mean, we're having an election. Yeah. Malawi has really held very democratic elections, mm -hmm. you know, despite, you know, some of the um, issues that we are talking about. Malawians are 
an incredible people. Mm. People uh, that are very welcoming, very pleasant, very mm. nice people. Mm. I had the opportunity to be there in July last year mm. for about a week, and I was incredibly, incredibly amazed about them. They reminded me of some of the neighborhoods that I grew up in, in southwestern Uganda. Oh. Not to mention that your language itself mm -hmm. is almost like uh, our language, really. Yeah. When you think about the election next week, do you get the sense that uh, Malawians are going to vote according to issues, or is it going to be about personalities? Oh. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, I think it's going to be a mixture of both. Um, like, um, I mean, things are changing, because we know Malawi, we, we we're really new to this whole like you know voting issue like um if you look at the beginning from like 1994 1999 coming to like 2004 it seems like voting was mostly on like you know personal alignments and like you know ethnic groups of like okay this candidate is for my ethnic group i'll vote for that guy but as we've been transitioning to like you know the most recent um elections it seems like we had there's like a, you know of course like uh, the transition is maybe a little bit slow but like um this is a little bit of a transition to like, you know, going from like personal alignments towards like issue based, like, you know, making decisions based on like issues. And I feel like um, that is why, like, for example, in 2009, we see that uh, Bingo Amtalika like won with a very, very clear and tight that has never, because apart from Bingo in 2009, no other political party, no other president has ever won in Malawi with more than 50% of the votes. And Bingo was the only one who did that. And like, you know, if it's more of like personality or maybe like you're voting on like a yeah, ethnic group alignment, Bingo wouldn't have gotten that 56%. Mm -hmm. So I think like, um, Right now, I feel like people go for issues, mostly. What, about, uh, what about the fact that uh, Malawi, like um, most other African countries, uh. is a beneficiary of the changing demographics? Uh. A majority of the average Malawian voter, yeah. from what I can see, is going to be a very, very young person. And from also my homework, yeah. it would seem to me that the vast majority of the Malawian young people would like to vote for change because they are not invested in the current status quo. Yeah. They have no jobs. They do not think they have tomorrow. And that the vast majority of those young people actually happen to support the incumbent vice president, yeah. Saulos Chirima, yeah. a man of a united transformation movement. Mm -hmm. In fact, he calls his party movement. Mm -hmm. And there's a good reason for that, he said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, you've spoken very well because uh, I have just written here, youth unemployment. Yes. If the demographics, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, if the demographics is that the voter is a youthful uh, character, right. personality, I don't mean character in a bad way, right. but a, 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 the persona of the, uh, the voter, the majority of the voters is useful. The uh, UTM has been talking of the creation of jobs. And the creation of jobs in a very imaginative way. I mean, you can't just, you know, you're not going to like have a magic wand and then have the jobs mm. uh, c come uh, in. But um, Talking of the issues, we have to also remember that Malawi is an agricultural-based country. Uh, we have not uh, industrialized. We did have uh, some industrialization, you know, in the 30-year rule of Dr. Banda. Mm. Unfortunately, through privatization uh, during our first uh, 10, 15 years of democracy, most of those uh, industries were closed, mm. sold, or, or the government disinvested from from their hold because they were like national entities. Mm. So, in the process of uh, delinking government from the activities of commercial enterprises, we lost a lot of our industries. Mm. So, uh, I've, I've listened to a lot of the 
uh, rallies that Dr. Chilima has been talking, mm -hmm. and he's talking of using the agriculture. We didn't have an agricultural in, uh, agricultural revolution mm. the way the West did. Mm. We just went straight into uh, industrialization. Mm. So he's talking of going back into the uh, grassroots and, you know, investing and saying, let us, you know, uh, have commercial farms, but also let's have, uh, you know, household uh, farming, mm. you know, individual farming, but then tie them in to some form of um, an industry-based uh, entity that's in the rural areas, so that you're actually uh, focusing on, like, putting yeast into um, the, the activities of the agricultural uh, sector mm. within the rural area. So, you know, the people are not relying on going into the urban centers. So what about uh, Raza's Chakwela of the Independence Party, mm -hmm. Malawi Congress Party? Ma the first, yeah, the first uh, Malawi, uh, Malawian party. Lazarus Chakwela also has got some very, very good and novel, uh, novel ideas, it, it, you know, that have been infused in his, um, in his, um, in, in the manifesto, I shouldn't say his manifesto, but the, the party's manifesto. Mm. And I, you know, we do and we must respect the Malawi Congress Party. They're the ones that led us in the 31 years. And in that 31 years, I was there, I was growing up, you know, in, in that time. Malawi had had it good. I am told that, in fact, we had uh, it good. And the agriculture. majority of the infrastructure that you see the majority in the, the infrastructure mm -hmm. but don't say the majority is the cut infrastructure of, of the Malay Congress party doctor Hastings Kamuzu Banda yes. the Wamuya that's true yeah. the Nguazi. yeah very true <laughs> i must say like um, you know you mentioned the idea of like uh, there's so much voter apathy in Malawi which is true and part of it like you know part of the like the narrative that people give for being like very apathetic about like um elections is like they point out to issues like oh most of the infrastructure we, we see they were under dr kamusubanda and like you know we transitioned to like um democracy and there were so many promises of like oh now you're becoming democratic you know prosperity is gonna come and all that we've had series of like um elections where we change political parties and all that but when you compare, like, you know, the development activities, like, you know, the uh, deliverables that have happened during, like, uh, the uh, multi-party era compared to the dictatorship, people now are start, some of the people start to point to, like, oh, maybe Malawi should go back to dictatorship now. It's like, you know, because, of course, it's a little bit ridiculous, but, of course, it's their opinions and all that. To, to dictatorship? Some people say that. Or do they look they at say those, like, okay. those years as uh, good old days? And, like, it's mostly, of course, people, like, uh, uh, fight back against this idea. Like, most of the people who were there would be like, okay, you know what? Mm. It was really terrible then, and, you know, for you to be making those kind of, like, suggestions, like, oh, maybe we should go back to dictatorship is very terrible. But, like, um, people uh, point out to the fact that there's mostly, like, you know, no national agenda that you know gets continued when you're changing political parties like you know people say like okay the, we were able to like Camus was able to institute all those infrastructure like you know developments because you know he had 30 years of mm. doing all that mm. but now because we're changing now and then political parties most like uh, projects that get started by one uh, one leader once that leader is out of power those uh, uh, projects get continued discontinued right so mm. But it when is. you think about it, really, uh, from everything I have, I have read, yeah. and a lot of people that I was able to talk to and with when I was in Malawi last year, yeah. the economy is stupid. Yeah. Poverty yeah. is like an equal opportunity employer. Yeah. Why would Malawians, you think, uh, vote for a vote of confidence in the current government, the Democratic, the Democratic Progressive Party. Well, um, I guess okay. I pay attention to like you know um, uh, voices that people um, you know present. For example, like you know Facebook groupings or a bit like WhatsApp groups and like Twitter all that. Um, and from what I've observed, mostly like. Um, 
people look at, for example, you talked of like Chirima. Mm. Uh, most of the people who are like in his movement are from like DPP. Like came from DPP. Him, even himself, I mean, came from DPP to mm. form his uh, movement. Correct. Uh, you look at Chakwera. Uh, now he is like in an alliance with Just Banda, who, I mean, unfortunately, Just Banda is like, you know, aka Cashgate. So you look at, okay, people are like, okay, uh, UTM is just frustrated people who have moved out of like uh, DPP mm. because uh, they were denied maybe like, you know, opportunities in DPP. Mm. Uh, uh, Chakwera is like, um, it, it, I mean, she, he's in with cash gate. Right. So therefore, the devil you know is better than the angel that you don't. Really? Those are the reasons that people... But what about the fact that, for example, uh, Janet, uh, the last time I checked, uh, the Malawi National Assembly mm. is controlled by the Malawi Congress Party, correct? Yeah, the majority of the uh, members of parliament come from the Malawi Congress Party. So if they could, in fact, control the national, I mean, the national assembly. How come that could not possibly translate into the presidency? Let me tell you something. Okay, I'll, I'll <laughs> answer that question by way of speaking to, like, the change in the electoral law. Mm. Okay, the, the the government has instituted a commission, the review of the electoral law commission mm. okay now in that and i was speaking to some of your uh, colleagues before we started the show in that was a a segment that said that there will be a seat in every district 28 districts of malawi mm. reserved only to be contested by women when that you know the proposal the proposed law got into the in front of the minister of justice mm. they took out that that part they took it out they took it out I and see. as you know as women of course we protested but what the government then did is to call to the palace various members of the different political parties mm, 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 and mm. because they control the coffers mm. they offered the money and when they went in to vote they mm. voted against it there really? were a lot of members of the Malawi Congress Party Very that voted against that, you know, that, that uh, new law. Very interesting. You know, you both said that uh, as far as Madame Joyce Banda was concerned, yeah. Cashgate was her political Achilles heel. Yes. Possibly her political albatross. Mm -hmm. What about uh, these allegations, for example, that incumbent president, Professor Peter Mutalika, uh -huh. may have received a kickback of about four million U.S. dollars. Uh -huh. Any truth in that? And if it is true, where does that leave him? Well, um, I mean, those uh, allegations were true, I would say, because I think, like, um, he came back, like, later on after people, like, protested, like, you know, after that, um, when this news came out and people started protesting against it, he said, like, oh, he will return back the money. Uh, he actually said he returned back the money? I think so. If I'm not, if I'm I not wrong. I don't know about the $4 million, but mm. I do know there was that other... The Kareem one. The, yeah, the Kareem, uh, not, oh, not, not relation of mine. Not, <laughs> not you, of course, but like uh, Zamia. Oh, no, 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 I mean you, Zamia. Yeah. There was like a... Um, yeah, uh, the 54 billion yeah. uh, kwacha, and he, ret he, you know, he returned it back. Um, those are, that's an admission of, uh, you know, guilt yeah. yeah and uh you know any you know intelligent you know thinking malawian would you know actually have to think twice uh when they are voting and they should vote their their conscience that you know and this is not this is just one of the many things that have been going on wrong within with this with the current government so yeah. it looks like really yes there are seven candidates the last time i checked uh, who <laughs> yes. are trying men. to be the next occupants of state house yeah. yes and you've already talked about two of the most competitive here having problems really you talk about uh, Lazarus have problems uh, by, by by proxy you mm -hmm. know so because of being associated 
-hmm. with someone that were, had uh, was uh, accused for having been associated with Kashgate. Yes. Now you talked about incumbent president. Yeah. Huh? President Amutarika. Amutarika. Mm. The allegations of the four million kickback that could be politically an elephant in the room. Yeah. Doesn't that live like uh, Chirima? Chirima? Um, it does to an extent, but like again, like I said, like you know, there's still that um, voice of like, okay, these guys like you know f just frustrated. Mm -hmm. But also, some people point at the fact that you know he fell off with the incumbent president, but he continued to like you know hold to be like uh, the vice president, where he was not even doing like any duties yeah. that are like you know assigned to the, his uh, office. But he did not resign. Yeah. And he, was, he continued to receive, like, you know, his salary, what is... Uh, Malawi is a very interesting country, Can I very, speak very to that? tolerant. Yeah. Can I yeah. speak to that, yeah. please? Well, unfortunately, <laughs> it seems to me that uh, we have understand. soon to go, okay. uh, because time happens not really to be our best ally. Okay. Yeah. Well, before we go, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the passing of a Tanzanian billionaire business tycoon, author and philanthropist, Reginald Abraham Mengi. He passed away last week in Dubai, where he had been receiving treatment. He was 75. He was buried last Thursday in his ancestry home in Moshi, the Kilimanjaro region. He came from the humblest of the humble beginnings to become arguably one of Africa's most successful and the kindest businessman. Mengi was perhaps best known for owning one of the largest and most influential media companies in East Africa. Each year, he donated millions of US dollars to educational, medical, and religious institutions in Tanzania. The Straight Talk Africa family extends our profound and heartfelt condolences to the Mengi family and the people of Tanzania. May his soul rest in eternal peace. On that note, our guests today were Janet Zinati Karim and Rimbani Kamanga and Sangwani Mwafurirwa joined us earlier from Lilongwe. Thanks to our audience for tuning into Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not beta Malawi. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive.